my collections had been in the hold of the burning ship, so that all the reward of four years of privation and danger in the Amazonian jungle was irretrievably lost. Hundreds of new and beautiful specimens of insects and birds, sketches, notes, and the three most interesting years of my journal. As the days went by, I began to believe my life would end here, in failure and oblivion. When the rescue ship reached England, I decided to return to my sister's house and take stock of my situation. I felt I had neither the strength nor the resources to plan another expedition. I did not know then that my most momentous voyage still lay ahead, and with it, the answer to the questions that had haunted me for so many years. And that's all? No insects? Nothing? You've been very unlucky. He's lucky to be alive. Ah, your sister's right there, Mr. Wallace. And he was lucky to have an agent with enough sense to insure his collection. Oh, that was nothing. That was just a normal procedure. How much do you think I'll get? Ah, well, now then, less than half the real value of your collection, I'm afraid. Possibly about 200 pounds. 200? Did you hear that, Fanny? And a week ago, I thought I was penniless. Why, I can live for a year on that. Well, you've been a very good client, Mr. Wallace. Your first consignment sold very well indeed, uh, especially the butterflies. I'd be very sorry to lose you. Lose me? Well, I understood you say that you'd sworn never to set foot in a ship again. Nonsense. That didn't last long, Mr. Stevens. One good meal of beefsteak and damson tart, and he was planning his next expedition, trying to decide between the Andes and the Philippines. Ah, not the Andes. No. No, well, you see, if you had a private income, things would be different. But as it is, you have to consider the market if you're even going to cover your expenses. And we're discovering that the demand for South American specimens isn't quite what it was. Where then? Next time you go to the museum, have a good look. Find out exactly what they've got and what they haven't got. You'll soon find out where the gaps in the collections are. Magnificent eye spots there. We have a private collection of African coleoptera from a retired naval gentleman arriving next week. Ah, yes, I'm afraid I shan't be in London again for some months. <laughs> This is Mr. Wallace. He sent us some very fine specimens from the Amazon. Mr. Charles Darwin. Mr. Darwin? Mr. Wallace, how do you do? I am honored to meet you, Mr. Darwin. I will be with you shortly. Interesting. The general habit's not unlike Italia funifera. That's true. 
But look at the sheathing. Ah, yes, and, and the petioles and the seeds. Yeah, no, no, there's no doubt about it. It's quite a new species. Yeah, another one for you to christen? Heria Wallacea, perhaps? You must be proud of your brother, Mrs. Sims. I am very proud of him. I just don't know where he gets it from. Really? Ah, I'd always assumed you came from a scientific background. Oh, Gracious, no. It was just a hobby to begin with. Yes, he tried all sorts of ways of earning a living, didn't you, Alfred? Mm. Uh, carpenter, watchmaker, builder, surveyor. And then one day he announced he'd saved up £100 and was off to South America with Mr Bates. He was luckier. At least he avoided the shipwreck. <laughs> He's still out there. So Mr Bates is the scientist? Mr Bates at that time was a draper's assistant. <laughs> <laughs> so you're both self-taught. <laughs> That's remarkable. I'd never have guessed it from reading your book. And now I hear you're going to the Spice Islands. Yes, I've been fortunate. I've been given a free ticket. I quite envy you. It'll be the perfect place to investigate the greatest mystery, as you call it. Well, I'll wish you bon voyage, then. Good day to you, Mrs. Sims. What did he mean, the greatest mystery? Oh, I told him once that that was my greatest ambition, to solve the problem of the origin of species. The origin of species? Fanny... Consider all these different plants. Think of all the birds and animals and insects and fishes and reptiles, thousands, millions of separate species. Where did they all come from? I don't know. Out of the ark? <laughs> well, you can't really believe that. No, it's impossible. It would have needed tens of thousands of arcs to get them all in. Do you know, Fanny, Bates once told me that within ten miles of Leicester alone, there are over a thousand different species of beetles. You and your beetles, Alfred. It was different last time. At least there were two of you. I hate to think of you out there all on your own. Oh, couldn't you hire an assistant? I can't afford it, Fanny. I want to pay him. I have heard of a young man who's keen to learn the trade. If he seems suitable, I might take him on as an apprentice. That would be a good start, wouldn't it? Charlie, sir. Charlie what? Alan, sir. Are you interested in animals? Charlie? Yes, sir. Which ones in particular? Well, I had a dog once, sir. And I used to like watching shrimps and crabs and things. Good. So did I. Well, Charlie. Yes, sir. You do realize that it'll be hard work, often under very difficult conditions. We'll be visiting some dangerous places, swamps, jungles, places where no white man has ever been. I don't mind living rough, sir. Well, that's good. You'll need patience, and you will need accuracy. Mounting and labelling insects is extremely intricate work. Are you good with your hands? Oh, yes, sir. My dad's a carpenter, and I can read and write if you'll learn me how to spell the names. It's going to be a long voyage. It would mean being away from your family for four or five years. Would you mind that? No, sir. And I don't mind the jungles and the cannibals. I'll go anywhere you like. Please, sir. Well... Could you be ready to leave on Tuesday? Where to? Where is it we're going? Starting from here. It's right round the other side of the world. There. Few places are more interesting to a traveller from Europe than the island of Singapore. Furnishing as it does, examples of a variety of Eastern races and of many different religions and modes of life. Oh, Charlie, now mind your head here. Yep, what? Get out. Hello. 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 H
After my long voyage by steamer to Alexandria, then overland to Suez, thence across the vast Indian Ocean, the waterfront of this bustling town was a welcome sight. I shall arrange for the transport of our luggage. Sir? You keep a close watch on the guns, and please Mr. bring that tin box with you, if you would. Yes, Mr. Wallace. Does anyone speak English? Yes, yes, ah. I can speak English. Good. Uh, and what is your name, sir? Jasmine. Uh, Mr. Jasmine, we wish to go to the mission at Bukit Timur. Do you understand? Yeah, I know the place. Singapore on a fine day is as crowded and busy as Tottenham Court Road. The scene is at once so familiar and yet so strange. The boatmen at the ferry, a dozen begging and disputing for a farthing fare, the Chinese coolies, the dark-skinned Klings from southern India, the Javanese sailors and the short brown Malays, all as pushing and full of business as any Londoners. Make sure that they take care of those nets, if you want. That's splendid. Just put that in place and be very careful. It's very valuable. I am more convinced than ever that no one can appreciate a new country by a brief visit. Even after the eight years I was to spend in the East, I could only begin to understand the special character of this island of Singapore, which such a short time ago was an uninhabited jungle. How much? Sir? There's one more specimen box to go in the trunk. Birds and most other kinds of animals being scarce at Singapore, I took a house in the old and picturesque town of Malacca. From here I was determined to visit Mount Ophir in the middle of the Malay Peninsula. We took with us a good supply of dried food, together with our insect and bird boxes, nets, guns and ammunition. No, no, I'll pack this. If you could tie up the nets, where are the pin cushions? With a setting ball? That's right! Oh, it's going to be a splendid place for insects, Charlie. It's going to be a most profitable trip. We spent several days at the foot of Mount Ophir, in a little hut by a beautiful rocky stream, where we found hundreds of new or rare insects. The ascent took us through dense forest, through which we climbed laboriously all morning. Occasionally, we had fine views of distant hills and valleys covered with the same interminable forest and with glistening rivers winding among them. Carry on up. Charlie. There. Now, isn't that worth a climb? It's beautiful, Mr. Wallace. Really beautiful. We emerged at last onto a plateau, pretty clear of undergrowth, and in which we could walk freely. Above us towered the lofty forest, home to a multitude of creatures which we heard but seldom glimpsed. Another nymphalid, Charlie. Such a delicate little butterfly. 
the insects formed an assemblage of tropical luxuriance such as one obtains by looking over the drawers of a well-filled cabinet. Rotten bark is ideal for beetles, Charlie. Yes, Mr. Wallace. Ah, there we are. A longicorn. There. Isn't he a beauty, Charlie? Oh, what long feelers, Mr. Wallace. Mm. The killing box. On the undersides of the trunks clung numbers of smaller and more sluggish beetles, while others sat with outstretched antennae, ready to take flight at the least alarm. It was a glorious spot, and one which will always live in my memory as exhibiting the insect life of the tropics in unexampled luxuriance. Nasty sting. There. We have him. It was very striking to come out from the dark, cool, and shady forest onto the hot, open slope, where we seemed to have entered at one step from a lowland to an alpine vegetation. Of the luxuriant plants, the most remarkable were the picture plants. These wonderful tropical curiosities never seem to succeed well in our hothouses and are seen to little advantage. Here, they grow up into half-climbing shrubs, their strange pictures of various sizes and forms hanging abundantly from their leaves. How They continually excited my admiration by their size and beauty. Ah. Thank you, Charlie. What's that? Ah, it's an Argus pheasant. No, not that. That. Oh. A leech. Oh. Yes, this is a forest leech. It's rather handsome, isn't it, with the emerald stripes? We came upon many species of these forest leeches, and on bathing in the evening, generally found half a dozen on each of us. I had one who sucked his fill from the side of my neck, but who luckily missed the jugular vein. Towards evening, we reached a peak separated from the true summit of the mountain by a considerable chasm. Here, our porters declared they could carry their load no further. Certainly, it had been an exhausting climb. Strange. They said there'd be water here at Padangba too. Well, what we do, Mr. Wallace? There's certainly a spring up by the summit. I don't think I can. Come along, Charlie. I'll find you a drink. Ah. There. There's things floating in it. Dead flies. Yes, I know. It's carnivorous. It, it catches them and drowns them. Oh, it won't hurt you. Look. Dear Bates, your last letter almost made me long to be on the Amazon again. I'm writing this by firelight. We keep a fire going all night because there are said to be tigers. We haven't come across any yet, 
But last week, one of our porters sighted a rhinoceros. The birds here are really spectacular. But the beetles are truly amazing. Soon, I plan the sea crossing to Borneo to visit the kingdom of Sarawak, ruled by the so-called White Raja, Sir James Brooke. I've been warned that he's quite a formidable character. Mr... Uh, Mr. Wallace, Sir James. Wallace, of course. I had a letter about you from a member of the Royal Geographical. Uh, sorry, I was out. Please, one of the Malays ran the muck. When did you arrive? In Sarawak, mm. three days ago. Let's see now. You're the insect man. Yes. Chiefly insects, Your... Your Excellency. Your Highness. <clears throat> With the museum? Uh, no. I send them to an agent and he sells them. His brother's an auctioneer. He sells what? Beetles? And moths? You can make a living out of that. Um, uh, thank you. Yes, yes I can. And you find that interesting, do you? Oh, fascinating. Really? Hmm. Well, I used to find this country fascinating when I first came out here. Plenty of action in those days. The country was running alive with pirates, bandits, headhunters. <laughs> Expeditions every other week. Upriver, down the coast, rooting them out, putting the fear of God into them. <laughs> Thing is, I've been here too long. Once you've licked the place into shape, there's nothing left to do but to dwindle into an administrator, wet nursing the natives and sorting out their everlasting squabbles. At one time, every weekend, this place would be full of all kinds of adventurers and fighters and prospectors and freebooters, arguing and planning and swapping ideas till Two o'clock in the morning. Now I've got Spencer here, passing on doctor's orders that I'm to be in bed by ten. And who do we get? Seedy little lawyers and missionaries and ICS wallers and... And insect men? <laughs> and insect men. <laughs> That's nonsense. One species can never turn into another species. It's plain nonsense. It's not, you know. Well, damn it, man, if I made a mare with a stallion, I expect to get a foal. And that's what I do get. Not a bear or a camel or a pussycat. If I plant an acorn, I get an oak tree. Now, you're not telling me that you can hatch out a hen's egg and get a turkey out of it never in a million years. Ah, now that's precisely it. You go back a few million years, and the same species aren't there. Oh, you get fossils of great huge reptiles or ferns as high as a steeple. But what you do not find is camels and bears and pussycats and oak trees. Why do you think that is? Well, people uh, haven't looked hard enough. They'll be found. You wait and see. All right. I'll wait. If they're found, I'll take it all back. Well, perhaps there were successive generations. One lots of things get uh, wiped out and uh, another lot appears in its place. Where from? Well, how do I know? But if God did it once, he could do it twice. He could scrap the lot and start again with something entirely different. He didn't do that, though. Now, how do you mean? When a new species appears, it never is entirely different. Oh? Mm. There's always been something there before that was very much like it. And it lived in the same place, or close to it. Always? Always. That's the law. Mm. Who told you that? Nobody told me. I worked it out for myself. It would seem we've been entertaining a genius unawares. Makes you think, though, doesn't it? Now, what baffles me is how you can make money out of it. What do they fetch, these, uh, these insects? Oh, it varies. I've got some that I found on my way here. Back in England, you could get fourpence for one of these. Oh. 
Hmm? Oh. My lord. They're alive, by God. Of course they're alive. <laughs> You still haven't explained how one species can turn into another species. I mean, why should it? What makes it happen? That's what nobody knows, yet. Mm. Is it by George? <coughs> it's gone midnight, Sir James. Oh, I'm all right, Spencer. Stop fussing. But see here, if you've got that much faith in your law, you should publish it. Like Wellington said, publish and be damned. I shall, too. When I get back to England. Now, when will that be? Five or six years? Too long. Mm, I can't spare the time while I'm out here. Got to get on with the collecting. No, you won't get much collecting done when the rains come. And you could write it in a few days. Uh, why not stay on here and do it? Spencer and I are off to Singapore on Monday. The place will be empty. I will arrange a boy to cook your meals. How's that? My dear Fanny, yesterday I captured a remarkably elegant butterfly. I found it in a clearing, flying swiftly between rocky pools and settling to drink. This beautiful creature is a new species, and I am naming it Ornithoptera brookiana, after Sir James Brook, who has persuaded me to write up as a paper my ideas on the natural law that regulates the introduction of new species. You may tell Mr. Stevens that his patience will be rewarded, for the beetles and butterflies here in Sarawak are abundant. During the dry weather, I was very fortunate in finding a good locality for beetles and collected about 2,000 species. I found one place only where I could collect moths and have obtained altogether about 1,000 species. With the butterflies, I reckon that my number of different species is now about 6,000 and of total specimens collected, about 30,000. But of the entomological riches of the East, I still consider the magnificent butterfly Ornithoptera brookiana to be the most elegant insect in the world. Yes? Please, Mr. Wallace, sir. I've lost the scissors. Yes, you left them out here on the veranda. You always do. Thank you. How is the barber coming on? <laughs> Sir, where are we going next? We're going up the Sedong River, Dayak country. It will be hard going, I'm afraid. Sir, I've been wondering if I... Sir, I went to the mission again last night. Father Delilah is looking for a boy to learn how to be a teacher, sir. And would you like that? Well, only if you think you can manage without me. Oh, Charlie. This will be a great opportunity for you. I'm sure I'll manage somehow. I engaged a Malay boy named Ali as a personal servant. Go on. He was very attentive and clean and could cook very well. He soon learned to shoot birds, to skin them properly, and latterly even to put up the skins neatly. In all the difficulties and dangers of our journeys, he was quite undisturbed and ready to do anything required of him. Tabby. Look, one, monkey. What kind? Macaques? No, no. Orampute. Look, that's one. Oh, by heaven, so there is. It's a long nosed monkey. Extraordinary creature. What was that name you called him? Orampute. Why are you laughing? 
What does it mean, Arlie? Orang putih, white man. Tuan! <laughs> I don't understand. Are you saying that Alfred shouldn't have written this paper? What's wrong with it? Well, there's nothing wrong with it as such. It's, uh, it's quite well presented. I gather that even Mr. Lyle has commented on that. Who's Mr. Lyle? Oh, he wrote Principles of Geology. He's a very famous man. Well, there you are. If he agrees with what no, Alfred is written... No, 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 Mrs. Sims, he doesn't agree that species change. No reputable scientist is going to take that seriously. It's just one of those eccentric ideas that keeps on cropping up. It's been completely discredited. It just doesn't hold water, you know. Surely Alfred has a right to his own opinions. Oh, indeed. But I do wish, for his own sake, next time you write to him, you impress on him that his latest specimens have aroused a good deal of interest. We're getting a lot of inquiries. The prices are right, and he is our sole source of supply from that region. Now, that's his real job, Mrs. Sims. I mean, that's what he's qualified to do, not sit around thinking up some fanciful ideas. It was along the tributaries of the Sedong River that I first encountered the Dayak people of Borneo. too great a rarity to be allowed to escape. I was treated like some strange new animal, captured and transported to their longhouse to be examined and approved. Shoes, one, shoes, shoes. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Yes, of course. During my residence among the Dayaks, I was much struck by their way of life, and I'm inclined to rank them high in mental capacity and moral character. Other than headhunting, crimes of violence are unknown amongst them. The Dayak Longhouse affords a simple, lively and honest existence. The more I see of uncivilized people, the better I think of human nature on the whole. The essential differences between civilized and savage man seem to disappear. What are they saying, Ali? It's the women, Tuan. What do they want? They want to know what color the other parts of you, Tuan. Oh! Same all over. Look. They want to know what country you come from, Tuan. Ah. England. Ong Long. Ah. Ah. Ong Long. <laughs> Ong Long. <laughs> be so surrounded by the prodigality of nature, each individual insect and animal so perfectly fashioned, each species so subtly distinguished from every other, 
impressed on my mind the infinite variety of the forms of living things. My Dayak friends became expert at trapping for me the elusive creatures of their forest. For them, these were often mere objects of superstition, but for me, they were valuable examples of the seemingly endless variations to the basic design of nature. Oh, oh that's really splendid. Yes, thank you. Terima kasih. Ah, <laughs> terapin. Thank you. Kukura. Kukura. Mm. Thank you. Tell you, uh, Could you take the monkey cage, monkey cage, yes. to the forest? Yes. Uta. Oh, Thank you. Ah, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Tell you, Ali. Yeah. Mm. Oh, my goodness. A porcupine. Behind this diversity, I felt there must surely be some kind of pattern. Oh, 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 oh. oh how good to see you. Oh, my dear Lyle, it's been a long time. <laughs> Too long. Oh, well, I'm such a wretched invalid nowadays, and London tires me out. But we'd love to see our old friends, don't we, Emma? Oh. I'll see you at luncheon, Sir Charles. Right. <laughs> now then. <laughs> How's the great work coming along? Oh, slowly, slowly. Not too slowly, I <laughs> Tell me, have you read an article by A.R. Wallace in the Annals? Yes, but why? It's one of the reasons I've come down to see you today. I was deeply impressed by it. Really? Yeah. Oh, from you, that's high praise. <laughs> don't tell me you're coming round to my evolutionary heresies after all these years. No, I don't say you've converted me, or that Wallace has converted me. I'll tell you what I have done, though, since reading that article. I've started keeping my own notebook on evolution. It really is beginning to look like a tenable hypothesis. Yes, he... Uh... Explain the case very cogently. But he hasn't got a fraction of the evidence that you've collected. How long have you been working at it now? Twenty years. Ah. Couldn't you publish even a shortened version? Well, surely you can see that a mere sketch would do more harm than good. Though there must be a mass of evidence behind it, so solid and so weighty that no one will be able to brush it aside. If you wait too long, you may never do it at all. There's no danger. I have left written instructions for Emma, even if I died tomorrow. That's not what I mean. Wallace might do it before you. Wallace? Well, that's hardly likely. He's a collector, isn't he? He seems to be close on your heels. No, 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 I wouldn't say that. He's only got half the theory. He hasn't found the cornerstone, the mechanism. Not yet. No, no, but he, he's still engaged on the field work. He's thousands of miles from any libraries, any museums. He'll be in no position to do any serious work until he gets home. And that may not be for a long time. It was after having spent two years in Singapore, Malacca and Borneo that I made a somewhat involuntary visit to the island of Bali on my way to Makassar. Avi! Come, 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 come. Ah. Kita de sini. Huh? Uh, Mau Kasana. Da Kabali. Uh, no, 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 Mau ma ma Kasana. Kabali. Uh, uh, Mau ma Kasana. Da Kabali. Bali. Bali. Yeah. Bali. Yeah. Bali. 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 Mm. Well, I don't intend it. Had I been able to obtain a passage direct to Makassar, I should probably never have seen the twin islands of Bali and Lombok, and would have missed some of the most important discoveries of my whole expedition to the east.
During the two days that we spent on Bali, I was both astonished and delighted. We landed at Bileling in the north of the island, and before setting off to spy out the nakedness or fertility of the country, we took a walk through the village, entering some of the houses where we were kindly received. Here on Bali, the people are of the Hindu race and religion, a remnant of a civilization which once crossed the whole archipelago. The unique way of life of these gentle island people embraces every facet of their day-to-day -day work and worship. On the second day, we walked into the surrounding country to catch insects and shoot birds. I had never beheld so beautiful and well-cultivated a district out of Europe. The luxuriant rice grounds are watered by an elaborate system of irrigation. The whole surface of the country is divided into irregular patches, each of which is itself perfectly level, but stands a few inches above or below those adjacent to it. Every one of these patches can be flooded or drained at will by means of a system of ditches and small channels into which are diverted streams that descend from the mountains. Every patch now bore crops in various stages of growth, some almost ready for cutting, and all in the most flourishing condition and of most exquisite green tints. In the east of the island, I came across a weaver bird with a bright yellow head, building its bottle-shaped nest in some trees by the coast. This bird is a native of Java, and here in Bali, as I later discovered, it was at the extreme limit of its range easterly. In so well cultivated a country, I could do little in natural history. Sadly, I neglected obtaining some other species which I never met again. I was not then aware of how important a locality this was for elucidating the geographical distribution of animals, and that I was now standing on the boundary of two distinct zoological regions. Beautiful place, Duan. Yes. Beautiful. All the same, I think we must move on. Oh. Well, it is only by chance that we're here at all. Hmm. I think we'll try the next island. Over there. Can you see it? Mm. That's Lombok. Our sail across the narrow strait afforded us superb views of the volcano on Lombok rising 8,000 feet out of the mists and clouds that surround its base. The terrain on Lombok is characterized by an arid climate that produces a stunted and thorny vegetation, altogether quite different from that on neighboring Bali. We made a journey to the eastern corner of the island. Here, everything grew zigzag in an inextricable tangle. To my delight, I came on an isolated forest of magnificent buttressed trees, the scale and beauty of which I had never seen during my travels in the east. This was the only patch of true forest on the island, highly agreeable after the heat and glare of the open country. Here, birds were varied and plentiful, and I collected many species which I'd never seen before there was an abundance of the curious Tropidorhynchus, allied to the friar bird of Australia, and here called Quechquech from its strange loud voice. And common too were the pitters, shy ground thrushes, which I trapped in the dense thorny undergrowth of the forest. Cockatoos? That's very odd. New birds, do No, not new, there's plenty of them in Australia. Just ordinary cockatoos. Well, what are they doing here? 
Here on Lombok, I discovered many Australian forms which are quite absent from the islands westward from which we'd come. What's that heap, Duan? Good God. I can hardly believe it. It looks like the mound of a megapode. Any more needed? No. A bird. They bury their eggs, you see, to incubate them. Yes, it is. Megapoda. I, I, I don't understand it, Ali. It, it's an Australian species, you see. It shouldn't be here at all. Now, calm down, Wallace. Facts. You need more facts. This much is clear, then. On Bali, but not on Lombok, woodpeckers, pheasants, trogons. On Lombok, but not on Bali, megapodes, lorries, cockatoos, honeysuckers. I know another one like that, Duan. Man on the boat told me. Oh, what's that? On Bali, it's ghost of dead people. On Lombok, no ghost. Write it down. So along this line, Ali, millions of years ago, when the world was a different shape, on that side, the species moved down from India. On this side, they moved up from Australia. The two continents moved closer and closer together. And somewhere near to here, they met. Hmm. Probably there. Under the sea. That's where the join comes. And you and me, Ali, we're the only two people in the world who know about it. Ah, oh, thank you. Why not leave them till you're strong? No, I feel much better today. Oh, I'll answer one or two anyway. Well, let's see. This one came a fortnight ago. From a Mr. Wallace. He says he had a paper published two years ago about species, and everybody ignored it. He says he once saw you in the British Museum. Oh? I don't remember that. Hmm. My dear sir, I thank you for your letter of September the 27th. You say you have been somewhat surprised at no notice having been taken of your paper in the annals the year before last. But you must not suppose that your paper has not been attended to. Two very good men, Sir Charles Lyle and Mr. Edward Blythe at Calcutta, especially called my attention to it. Though agreeing with you on your conclusion, I believe I go much further than you. You go much further, do you? You must have seen something I haven't seen. I have now been at work on my book more than 20 years. I get on very slowly, partly from ill health. You ask me whether I shall discuss man. I think I shall avoid the whole subject, as it is so surrounded with prejudices. Avoid the whole subject? Forget man? <laughs> I am astonished that you expect to remain out there three or four years more. What a wonderful deal you will have seen, and what an interesting area.
Yeah. The talk, the talk. Terry McCarthy. I'm back, what? Oh, no, no. No, leave it. We'll do it later. Hmm. That was the best meal I've had for weeks. I've a mind to use this place for a base while we're here in the Moluccas. Come back every few weeks, sort out what we've got, and send it off. Hmm. We've come a long way these last six months. Born here. Remember those Dayak people at the Longhouse? It's one strange thing, though. It's very odd. They're healthy enough. And they have more food than they can eat. And yet there are so few of them. Hmm. Now, back in England, the population has doubled in just 50 years. Hm. Malthus was right. Prodigious power of increase, he called it. War and plagues limit populations, he said. Now, that's in spite of infant mortality. It doesn't have to be only catastrophes, though. Cold one? No. Hot. I'm afraid it's another attack of the ague. Did we pack the quinine when we left Amboina? I go and look. Where did they all come from, Alfred? Out of the up. Always where there's a closely related, pre-existing species. You still haven't explained how one species can change into another. The individual deaths don't matter. It's as Malthus said, but nobody knows the mechanism. I agree with everything you wrote about the genesis of species, but I would go further, much further. Doesn't matter as long as some of them survive. The strongest ones, or the ones who can run fastest, or the ones best fitted to the kind of... That's it. Uh, water? Uh, pencil, paper. Not one. Tomorrow. The numbers that die annually will be immense. Those that die must be the weakest, while those that prolong their existence can only be the most perfect in health and vigor. It is a struggle for existence. Useful variations will tend to increase, use less or hurtful variations to diminish. The giraffe did not acquire its long neck by desiring to reach the foliage of the loftier shrubs, but because any varieties which occurred with a longer neck than usual secured more food than their shorter-necked companions and were thereby enabled to outlive them. Dear Mr. Darwin, I enclose a paper which I have just written, and I would very much like to hear your opinion of it. I hope the ideas contained in it will be as new to you as they were to me, and will supply the missing factor to explain the origin of species. When you have read the paper, I would be much obliged if you would show it to Mr. Lyle. That is, if you consider it sufficiently novel to merit his attention. Thank you. Thank you. Yours very sincerely, Alfred R. Wallace. It's bad news, my dear. 
I'm afraid he's worse. He was crying all night. The nurse fears it's the smallpox. I, I, I've sent for the doctor. I see. I'm sorry to hear that. Charles, what is it? Are you ill? What's happened? From Mr. Wallace. What does it mean? My whole theory of natural selection, the work I've given my life to. He's got it all there, the whole essence of it. The moment that is published, it becomes Wallace's theory, not mine. All my originality is smashed. Oh, Charles, that wouldn't be fair. You thought of it years ago. Well, that makes no difference. It's my own fault. Uh, Lyle warned me that it could happen. Well, it has, with a vengeance. Charles. He doesn't actually ask you to get it published, just to show it to Sir Charles Lyle. Couldn't you write back and ask him exactly what he intends you to do? And in the meantime, well... I could publish a paper myself. Oh, Emma. Sorry. Of course you can't do that. It would be so simple. It would only take me a week, but it would be despicable. We could have sent it to the publisher himself if that's what he wanted. Well, perhaps... He was afraid there were some flaws in it that he hadn't seen. Well, he needn't have worried about that. It's... It's very well done. Why did he pick on you to send it to? I can only suppose that it's because he... trusts me, God help me, to act in his best interests. This is the blackest day of my whole life. What will you do? I'm, I really don't feel able to deal with it. I will, of course, do as he asks. I'll uh, send it to Lyle. What about Mr. Hooker? He's always been a good friend, too. Yes, yes. Lyle and Hooker, they can handle it between them. And do whatever they think is right. Back in two hours. We're the first. I don't think there'll be a big attendance. Why not? Well, after all, it's not a regular meeting. Oh, it's only because Brown died. They're electing a new secretary to the society. I, uh, I wonder if we're doing the right thing. It's too late to have any qualms now, Hooper. The die's cast. Have you seen our president since I wrote to him? Well, he wasn't too happy. But with your name behind it, he could hardly refuse. I've been wondering how Wallace is likely to take it. He can't possibly raise objections. After all, Darwin told me of his theory in 56. I recorded it in my notebook at the time. And we've got his 1842 outline and his letter to Asa Gray. They're not the most elegant of documents, but at least they prove that Darwin was first in the field. Enough to satisfy any fair-minded person. But all the same, I do wish he'd taken my advice and published earlier and saved all this fuss. Ah, Mr. President. Thank you very much for agreeing to read these papers into the Society's proceedings. I'm sorry it had to be at such short notice. Not at all, Sir Charles. May I ask if Mr. Darwin will be here to introduce his own contribution? No, I'm afraid he can't. There's been a death in the family. And now his eldest daughter is seriously ill. But he's put the matter unreservedly in our hands. I see, and Mr. Wallace has done the same. 
the charge. Mr. Wallace referred the matter to me without any explicit instructions. I imagine he intended me to use my own discretion in the matter. You see, Mr. Bell, he's still in the Malay archipelago. Nobody knows precisely where. I had left the relative comfort of Ternate in search of birds of paradise and the other curiosities of New Guinea. I had never felt so remote. It is a country in which no naturalist had ever resided and which I might never visit again. The weather was still terribly wet, when according to rule it should have been fine and dry. In all my journeyings, I had never encountered such privations and annoyances. Sir Charles. Just one thing. I have this paper by, by Mr. Wallace, the two documents by Mr. Darwin. You haven't indicated in what order they're to be read. Ah. Shall we say alphabetical order? That would be best. Gentlemen, as you will have seen on your agenda uh, before embarking on the business of this meeting, I've been requested to read into the proceedings a communication with the title On the Tendency of Species to Form Varieties and on the Perpetuation of Varieties and Species by Natural Means of Selection by Charles Darwin, Esquire, FRS, FLS, FGS, and Alfred R. Wallace, Esquire, and Alfred R. Wallace, Esquire. Uh, communicated by Sir Charles Lyell, FRS, FLS, and J.D. Hooker, Esquire, M.D., V.P.R.S., F.L.S., C.B., O.M., L.L.D., F.R.S. Mr. Allen? What, Mr. Allen? Why, Charlie. Mr. Wallace. I heard you was back. I was New Guinea. Oh, dreadful. Everything went wrong. But what are you doing here? I've brought something to show you. Ah, oh, they're beautifully done. Where are they from? Those are from Sarawak. And these. Charlie, oh, they're quite superb. And these are from Mysol. Oh. But what happened about the mission? Oh, I got tired of it after a year or two. Every time I saw a butterfly, I thought, Mr. Wallace would like that. Yeah. And I thought, if I could work on my own and bring you what I find, we could cover more ground that way. Oh, this is splendid news. Really splendid. Tell me, when did you arrive? Just an hour ago. I came on the prow. Ah. Oh, I've got a letter for you. This is from Mr. Darwin. Excuse me. Is it good news, Mr. Wallace? He agrees with me, Charlie. I knew he would. Aren't you going to open it? Yes. After all, you did get it published for him. He should be pleased. 
Yes, but he thought he'd be the first. But he is still the first, in a way. You're both first. I don't see how he can possibly be angry about that. Not angry, no, but I'm afraid that he will be hurt. Charles, if you aren't going to open it, then I shall. Well? Oh. <laughs> there, you see? He's thanking you. He's honoured. Oh, Charles. What a very nice gentleman Mr. Wallace seems to be. I really do now think and believe that I am going home. I have been cleaning, arranging and packing about 16,000 specimens of insects, birds and shells. I know not how to express fully my appreciation of Darwin's book. I have read it through five or six times, each time with increasing admiration. Ali. Yes, Don. On parting with Ali, beside a present in money, I gave him my two double barrel guns. I would like you to have these. Thank you, Tuan. For six years, he had been my faithful companion of almost all my journeyings among the islands of the Far East. And then it all suddenly seemed to fall into place. I had a feeling of complete certainty. Yes. Do you know, Mr. Wallace, I could show you the exact spot where the same thing happened to me when I was driving in my carriage. <laughs> it came to me like a, a flash of light. <laughs> and you must let me say how much I admire the generous way you wrote about my book. <laughs> Most people in your position would have been full of envy and jealousy. But you speak far too modestly of your own work. The idea came to me as it had come to Darwin, in a sudden flash of insight. It was thought out in a few hours, for I was then the young man in a hurry. But the idea had occurred to him much earlier. He had already made it his own. Merciful Saviour, deliver us not into the bitter pains of eternal death. Thou knowest, Lord, the secrets of our hearts. Shut not thy merciful ears to our prayer, but spare us. Lord most holy, O God most mighty, O holy and merciful Saviour, thou most worthy judge eternal, suffer us not at our last hour for any pain of death to fall from thee. For as much as it has pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself... I do honestly believe that with however much patience I had worked, I could never have approached the completeness of his book. Mr. Darwin has created a new science and a new philosophy. I really feel thankful it has not been left to me.
to give the theory to the world. Thank you.